Recently, the Vox organization posted a video on YouTube that purports to show proof of evolution that you can find in your own body. These five proofs are rather interesting in nature in that they all involve structures and functions that they argue have been lost from an earlier ancestor. So instead of getting something new, they're explaining something that was lost. The first example they give is the palmaris longus muscle uh, in our arm, and the tendon is, white, is very long, runs out to our palm and we call that the palmar aponeurosis. And the function of this muscle is that it's a weak flexor of the wrist. The palmaris longus also functions uh, as an abductor of the thumb. So when our thumb comes away from our palm like this, that's partially the function of the abductor uh, muscles of the thumb, of which there are three, and the palmaris longus is one of those. So uh, absolutely functional muscle, uh, understood by anatomists, but dismissed by at least some evolutionists as being functionless and somehow proof of evolution. The second example is the auricularis muscles of the ear. Each ear on each side of our head uh, has three muscles. Uh, most people are not able to actually visibly move their ears with these muscles, although some can do this. It's argued that, again, these are left over from our ancestors who presumably, like a, a deer or a rabbit, uh, could move their ears around in different directions to pick up sound. Uh, the function of the part of the ear that protrudes here, the auricle, is indeed to help us pick up sound and to determine its direction. And there is evidence, as indeed the video reported, that these muscles do respond to nervous stimulation when sudden sounds are heard on either side of the body, causing us to reflexively look uh, in that direction. I think here's an example where we need to uh, let science run its course, and we may learn a lot more about the feedback that we're getting uh, from these muscles of the ear to help us determine uh, directionality of sound. The third example was goosebumps. What possible use are goosebumps? Uh, again, they're supposed to be vestigial from when we had long hair over our whole body and could elevate the hair sort of uh, as a scared cat might do, or elevate the hair for thermal regulation. As you can see in this model, all hairs have muscles. Uh, they're called the erector pili muscle. It do raise the hair. And in the case of most of the hairs of our body, the hairs are much smaller than the one shown here. Uh, they're called vellus hairs but they still have a muscle, they still have an oil gland called the sebaceous gland, they still have a, a hair shaft, they're just very tiny, almost invisible. When these muscles contract, they produce a bump rather than raise visibly a uh, hair. Uh, what function could such a muscle contraction serve other than to cause goosebumps, which is part of our whole emotional response to things that are thrilling or scary? It's also our response to cold. And perhaps the reason for that is when muscles contract, they generate heat. And so heat is produced in the skin with the contraction of these muscles. Also, notice that the oil gland is in this wedge-shaped area between the hair follicle and the muscle. And when the muscle contracts, it exudes oil onto the surface of the skin, which is important for retaining water in the dead layer of the skin, keeping it soft and supple. Finally, Every hair follicle and sweat gland, whether it's large or small, serves a very important function. When we have a deep abrasion of our skin that removes the upper layer, uh, if we had to wait for the skin to grow in from the edges, we would get tissue death, necrosis, uh, before the skin covered the uh, eroded area. Uh, in the case of hair follicles and sweat glands, they serve as a focus to re-epithelialize the surface rather than having skin grow in from the edges, it grows from thousands of little points throughout the abraded area. Another example of a presumably useless organ, in this case a, a bone in the body, is the so-called tailbone. Uh, the idea is that our monkey-like ancestors uh, had tails swung from the trees, uh, now, uh, since we have been apes and now humans, we, we lack this tail. And in its place is this little memory tag here uh, called the tailbone. Actually, the anatomical term is coccyx. 
and it is not a tail, and it is certainly not without function. In fact, if I were to rank the bones of the body on how important they are by how many different muscles attach from how many different directions, I would rank the tailbone up near the top. If you've ever fallen on your tailbone or your coccyx, you know it hurts. Just about any position you're in, it hurts. That's because all of these muscles pulling on this little piece of bony real estate. The whole rim of your pelvis, your hip bones, have muscles that converge on that little point of bone. These muscles uh, form what's called the pelvic diaphragm. It's a muscular bowl deep down in our pelvis and setting above it would be the bladder, the uterus, and uh, other parts of the bowel. If this muscle were not there, then because we are standing upright, uh, things would tend to herniate or, or pass uh, through uh, this floor. You can't overestimate the importance of this critical anchoring point uh, for six really major muscles of the pelvic diaphragm. The final example that's been given for uh, proof of human evolution, infants up to about the age of six months uh, have a, a grasp reflex. Uh, this is true of both the foot, a plantar reflex, and a, and a palmar reflex in the hand. Uh, what this means is that babies uh, from birth up to, say, six months, in the case of the palm, uh, if you touch the palm, the fingers flex. It's really a program reflex in the body, part of a number of reflexes that our body has. These reflexes are developing even after birth. So for the first six months, this grasp reflex can be detected, but eventually it's suppressed by our developing nervous system and uh, it no longer functions. It's sobering to reflect on the fact that back in 1890, there were 180 organs and structures in our body that were thought to be useless, uh, no function at all, uh, but we now know that uh, the vast majority of these have obvious functions and. I would argue there's no organ in the body or structure that can be clearly shown to be without function. The most important point, evolution needs to tell us how do we get new organs, not how do we lose the organs and functions we already have.